to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of Relationships Matter, and I'm really excited to be joined by Kira Glynn today. Hi, Kira. How are you? Cool, Jane. How are you? Great, great. As I say, very looking forward to our discussion now, Kira. So maybe before we talk about all things peer support and mental health, maybe you can tell me a little bit about yourself, please, and your background. Yeah. No problem, Jane. First of all, thanks for having me. I know we met last week and our, I think our values and our thoughts on a lot of these issues are aligned. And I love being in those spaces with people and looking forward to furthering our conversation today. So, yeah, my background, it's kind of, yeah, it's always a, a, a big question when someone asks you this and it's OK, because <laughs> um, I really don't know where to start sometimes. Sometimes I start in the past, but I think maybe for now I'll start in the present and cool. just explain what I'm doing and then maybe the journey to get here uh, briefly. So, yeah, I'm a operations manager of an out of hour service for where it's part of a model of care. Um, crisis prevention model of care. So we are operating out of a cafe, which during the week is a normal cafe, but then four evenings of the week, we turn into a mental health out of our supports. So um, I'm the operations manager in that. I'm only there about three months now, actually. Okay. Um, but before that, I worked in the HSC for seven years as a peer support worker. So I was part of the first cohort of peers employed by the HSC. So peer support workers have their own experience of distress, access and services and the recovery process. Mm -hmm. So back in 2017, the HSC uh, sent a pilot group really into the system, the guinea pigs. Okay. So I was part of that group. So I worked there for seven years and then came on to the role I'm in now. So the role I'm in now, um, we have peer connectors in the workspace. So um, it's great to be in that position now to manage peers, but also supervise peers and also lead in a non-clinical environment because in my peer role, I was in a very clinical space. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit further. But what got me to that point is, I suppose, many things in life. I'm a firm believer that all of our past and our past traumas really, you know, add up to the person we are today. Mm -hmm. So I would have grew up in a working class uh, community, Okay. a working class home. I grew up in poverty back in the 80s and I experienced a lot of childhood trauma. I was in a dysfunctional home, dysfunctional community surrounded by um, drugs, alcohol, a lot of social issues mm -hmm. and a lot of incidents and a lot of exposure to things at a very young age that I, I shouldn't have really been exposed to. And then in my mid um twenties or oh, mid teens, sorry, I did what a lot of people do in those communities, and that's turned to drugs and alcohol. Uh -huh. And if you had asked me at the time, I would have said I was doing it for the crack. Um, and yeah. but now that I'm older and you know have a bit of um emotional intelligence, I suppose, and and looking back on that period, it was really a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. And I think we were, it was a collective form of escapism. And through that, I discovered music and friends and I felt a real acceptance in those spaces. But it was also really suppressing all that childhood trauma okay. and the wider issues of what, what again, I wouldn't have been knowledgeable, knowledgeable on at that age. I mean, growing up in poverty, you know, there's discrimination, the class, um, you know that you feel different to others in society, but you can't really articulate it at that time. So in my mid twenties, um, all that trauma just came bubbling up and it was too hard to suppress it anymore. Mm -hmm. And the drugs and alcohol were helping in a way to keep me social, but they were obviously having a severe effect on the recovery process. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people are in that space of need and drugs and uh, the social outlet of drugs and what those communities bring 
but also wanting to heal from the recovery. So in my 20s, I developed a uh, really severe social anxiety and I went to the services at my early 20s and I was put on medication and I always thought, I, I always thought it was the drugs. I thought, okay. you know, you've really messed things up here. You've messed your mind up. You've taken too many taken drugs. Too many. And, and a lot of people think that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was throughout my journey that I realized, um, no, there was a lot of trauma under there. Certainly the drugs didn't help, but I mean, yeah. they did help for a time. Yeah. I, I really think they kept yeah. me alive. Yeah. And they kept me in a space of feeling accepted and wanted by my peers in those spaces. So, yeah, I yeah, in my 20s, I started to get really severe panic attacks. I couldn't leave the house um, and I didn't know what was happening to me. And I tried to hide that for years. And again, I masked that with alcohol. And when I was told I had a social anxiety disorder, I, I was really accepting of that label because okay. I thought, well, wow, there's a name for everything I'm feeling. I've since come on a journey with that and I've moved away from describing my life through a medical lens mm -hmm. um, because I always felt to tell me that I had a disorder was like there's something wrong inside of you inside of your brain mm -hmm. but no really no one really looked at my history or my life and if you look at my history in my life I have been harmed as a lot of people have by humans so therefore developing a fair humans is very rational mm -hmm. so I'm of the belief you know I say social anx anxiety because people understand that and they're aware of that especially in mental health spaces we're aware we're aware of that label so I use that but really personally I say I developed a really rational fear of people given my history mm -hmm. so yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I could branch off in loads of different ways on that. There's so much in that. Yeah. It's hard to kind of put your life story. But um, I think they're the kind of most important points anyway to touch on. Yeah, thank you so much, Kira. And obviously you mentioned that we had a chat last week and I also heard you um, speak first at Critical Voices Network of Ireland conference. Um, which is which is always amazing in giving different perspectives, often survivor perspectives of how the system itself can be very harmful. And um, I'm also very interested in how childhood trauma and relational trauma um, combined with poverty and inequity in our society can really impact people in terms of their health and their relationships and behaviour. So just to clarify, in that period when you had this disorder, this social anxiety disorder, none of the professionals linked back what you were feeling in your body around people, fear of going out, all of that, the drink and drug taking, no link made to what you experienced at home, in your community, in the unequal world that as a young girl you grew up in. Hmm. No, no, wow. <laughs> that's that's the answer to that is in a short no. And at the time, see, this is the the real. Um, I think the harmful thing around diagnosis and there's loads of debate around whether people identify with the medical model or not. And I suppose when I speak about these things, I never want to shame people for identifying with that. Course, that is completely a person's journey and how they make meaning in their life. But for me, when I first went to the mental health service, I was so terrified. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what I was feeling. I just thought I was crazy. I was strange. I was odd. I was different. And but but I did know that there was pain on some kind of conscious level. I knew there was a lot of hurt and pain buried there. I couldn't articulate it. And I I just kept going in to see the doctor every few months, being given a script. I was on um, a waiting list, like many people are, for psychology. This was back in 2006 now. Okay. So a long time ago. And in some ways, we haven't really moved on from that in some services and some teams and some uh, mental health spaces. But it's like I knew what I felt wasn't being met by the professionals, but I didn't know any better. Mm 
-hmm. And Mm -hmm. as when you're young and you're afraid, and I mean, this can happen when you're a bit older as well, you're putting all your trust in a mental health professional. So if someone is telling you, this is a disorder, this medication will help you, you need to follow on this path. Mm -hmm. And you do that because you have no other other choices. You don't know what else to do. So you're like, okay, I'm in this, I'll do all this. So that's what I did, like many people. But I did all that. And what I couldn't articulate then is what I can articulate now is that my needs weren't being met. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think (laughs) when I was 23, like, oh, this is the medical model and my needs aren't being met. (laughs) I don't know. Well, actually, in fairness, a lot of 23 year olds could probably speak to that now. Um, Language around mental health is everywhere. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I, I couldn't say that. So what I did was I left the services Mm -hmm. and I thought, whoa, I'm actually even more messed up than I originally thought because I went along. I did all they asked. I went to the therapy. I took the medication and still I feel and still I'm having panic attacks and still I can't leave my house and still I'm suicidal. So, yeah, I think a further internalized that feeling of worthlessness Mm -hmm. and hopelessness because I wasn't getting better under this system um so yeah that's that's my feelings and thoughts around that time thanks Kira. um one of my favorite kind of trauma gurus I guess is um a guy called Stephen Porges who came up with the thing called polyvagal theory and he says that really mental health problems and addictions can be better described as neural state disorders. Now, he still uses that word um, or nervous system. It's to do with the nervous system being overactivated, chronically overactivated and sensitized over time. And from what you describe there, you know, it does sound like your nervous system was in a chronic state of defense for a wide range of reasons, you know, the family stuff, the community stuff, the exclusion and not meeting your potential maybe and the drugs and alcohol uh, helped you survive. So that is that is an interesting thing, I think, because um, people can be very judgmental and think, oh, the choice, you know, people choose to do this uh, to harm themselves. But so many people have said to me, like you, that actually they kept them alive at a particular period of time, that there was good in them. Um but Vincent Filetti, one of the ACEs guys, said also it's hard to get enough of something that doesn't quite work. So I guess they didn't quite work. The drugs and the alcohol didn't quite repress the, the traumas and nor did the other medications that you were given um, or, or the talk therapies or whatever at a particular point. Can you identify for me some positive therapeutic or relational experiences that you had with mental health professionals. Hmm. Yeah, and I yeah, I agree with everything that you said there I can totally relate to that heightened state of fear, I would call it, and the, the hmm. threat feeling, you know, constantly being under threat. And I don't think a lot of people realize that if you grow up in a home where you feel constantly on eggshells and you know, there's fighting and there's fighting in the community. You know, you're built for that alert. And again, very natural, normal mm-hmm. reactions as a human being to have this stuff. So, yeah, I didn't have any positive experience in the service oh. with my mental health. When I left the service after four years, I did what a lot of people do. And I tried everything under the feck and okay. I think everyone does that and I I don't like this idea in society that people with mental health don't try enough because Jesus I tried everything I read every book I tried lots of different therapies you know I did the whole the whole lot and it wasn't until about so when I went into service that was about 2006 so I think it was about 2009 maybe we're talking I went in, sorry, 2010. It was when I left. So, yeah. So it would have been 2011, 2012. I um, found a psychologist in town and it was private. And at the time I was on a disability allowance, which that was another 
battle to even get that. That was rejected so many times because um, anytime I went to an interview, I could talk and I could speak. And, yeah, okay. you know, they said, you, you can talk and you speak. You, you don't need any disabled anything. enough kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was on 200 euro a week and 150 of that I paid for a private psychologist. Wow. And I did this. I did this with different people. I went to people first meeting. No, not for me. Went, left. And then I went to this girl and I finally like, you know, felt some warmth and care, I suppose, in that space. And she was the first person ever. And this is like now gone on five years, almost six years of speaking to mental health professionals. She's the per first person ever that drew the link to what was going on at the time that I started to get panic attacks. Okay. So at the time I got panic attacks, I was really severely bullied. I um, was bullied online. Mm -hmm. I used to DJ and I used to play all over Dublin back in my late teens and um, my 20s and into my 30s and um, into my late 20s. And um, I was bullied online really horrendously. I got a lot of prank calls uh, all the time to my phone, like daily prank calls. I got things sent to my house, proper like mean girl stuff. Mm. Um. And I started to get panic attacks around that time. Okay. And that's when I started to not being able to go out in social circles and, you know, I stopped answering my phone. It was like everything was a threat. Um, and yes, that was a trauma in itself, but it yes. was built on all this childhood trauma. Yes. So lots of people experience some bullying and horrendous things. And sometimes they can cope and manage with those things. But that's, I think, is really instilled in the formative years of childhood of how they have learned to cope and manage stress. And I didn't have that. Like my framework was stress. Yeah. So it was stress on top of stress and it just all exploded. So she was the first person that said what was happening at the time that you had the panic attack. And I said, oh, I was in a record shop in town and I was listening to music. And she said, uh, what was happening at that time? She said, no, not at that specific time, but in your life. I said, oh, I was DJing. I was, you know, partying with friends. She said, and how were, were friends? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, I had good relationships, good friends. And then. She said, and did you get on with everyone? And then I said, no, well, this, blah, blah, blah. And I went through and then it was like, she said, oh, really? And it just dawned on me in that moment. Whoa, that was really messed up that yeah. I went through that. And I'd never really acknowledged that again. I was burying that with everything. Mm -hmm. and then the floodgates opened and the floodgates wouldn't close <laughs> okay. and I just cried and cried and cried but it was such a release because it was the first time that I acknowledged that what had happened was related to my current state which was panic attacks social anxiety um, and I would say that was a real turning point in how I viewed myself and everything that happened to me and what came after that for years later was I began to self-analyze myself and I still do until this day. If I have a reaction or a feeling about something or something makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. And I mean, this comes with emotional intelligence that we build over time as people who have experienced distress. And I started to think, oh, why did I get so angry about that? Oh, well, yeah. you got angry about that because, you know, when you were six, whatever. Yeah. So it's it's great to be able to link those things. And I would say that psychologist gave me the skills to do that. Now, that wasn't enough on its own. Yeah, <laughs> It's like, I, I think they're little, I see it's a jigsaw and these are a puzzle. And these are little pieces that you're putting together to make meaning in your life. Mm -hmm. um, but that was very helpful and definitely a defining moment in how I made meaning in my distress and it was very very important to have experienced that because it changed the trajectory of my life then yeah. Um, I wouldn't say everything was great after that I mean I still spent the next five years not working not having a full-time job still drinking in social situations I mean, to the outside world, it looked like I was like thriving in life, maybe yeah, in the way time. that I was. 
yeah and I was <laughs> loads of parties very loud and <laughs> having the crack with everyone but really during the week I was suicidal and oh. thinking how am I going to like manage this and it just became a cycle and a circle and yeah so yeah but wonderful that that conversation took uh, I suppose some of the the maybe the sense of fundamental brokenness away from you that like there were these reasons for at least that you know those panic attacks made a whole pile of sense in the light of what you've been exposed to the cruelty and Mm. abuse of other people and just while we're talking about this like bullying is on the rampage online uh you know many children uh, can engage and adults can engage in bullying behaviors um Mm. you know I I recall not being terribly nice at one point in school myself you know uh Mm. we can all be harmful to one another um, do you think, though, having been on the receiving end of, of a campaign over a time that people actually get how harmful and how how it can really, again, put the nervous system into the sense of overwhelm and I can't cope and, I, the, you know, I don't belong in this world or whatever else. It can lead to these suicidal feelings quite frequently, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what I always think. Like I was lucky in one way that it wasn't the era of social media. Um, I'm showing my age now, or maybe I showed that when I said I was 23 when I went into the services in 2006. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I like th- that was back in the day of message boards where okay. it was all anonymous. And look, I know it's anonymous now. I mean, mm. you can go online and say your name is whatever, John whatever and you could be a woman 2021 yeah yeah you know so I know but there really wasn't any social media or TikTok or Instagram Mm -hmm. and I really think if I had lived in that era I mean even when you think of going partying into clubs like there wasn't a phone in sight back then and so what the youth of today have to live with and manage through is just really terrifying um and also to say like I'm not perfect either I've I've been mean to people throughout my life in school at different stages and you know um not really I've always been kind I think at the at the heart of who I am Mm. but I think we've all engaged in stuff because that's what we do we're humans and even pure dynamics pure dynamics can be very harmful as well you know belonging Mm. and not belonging or whatever yes. sorry for cutting across you there yeah no but it is it's all the relationships and I mean if you grew up in a home like my home and other people have grown up in homes where you haven't been shown uh like a role modeling of what healthy relationships are and like it's very hard to like replicate that then in your life going forward especially in your formative years when you're young and you're figuring it out and the hormones are flying everywhere and you don't know who you are or who anyone else is um so while I don't like obviously bullying is horrendous for anyone on the receiving end but I am always conscious and mindful of the reason why a person bullies another right. person. and I know it's a real cliche thing to say oh well they're unhappy with themselves but there is truth in that, you know, um, and what they've experienced and what they grew up and what kind of home did they grow up in and so forth. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Kira. Um, any particular negative uh, experiences within the system or ones that like you, you would say were kind of actually harmful to you that you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, yeah, there was one. And I I tell a lot of people about this and their jaw just hits the floor because they can't believe that this happened. Um, and sometimes I can't believe it happened either because it's a, another life. Um, but I can remember being on the waiting list um, for psychology and getting a therapist at the time. And see, this is the thing. I've worked on a mental health team, so I know my psychiatrist from my psychologist from my OTs to my social workers I know what they all do but when you're again a person that never moved in those circles you have no idea someone rings it on the phone and says do you want to come down have a chat with me just go down and chat to them you don't know what Mm -hmm. the hell they do so that (laughs) was kind of where I was back in that day in that time so 
I went to a therapist and um, she was doing some form of rational emotive therapy. I don't okay. know what it was called. Um, but again, you're the expert. I'll go whatever you want me to do. I'll do it. So um, I lived in Kildare at the time in Kilcock in the family home. That's another thing. Side now, I was very lucky mm. that I had somewhere to live, even though my home environment wasn't, um, you know, conducive to healing and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But I um, I was very lucky to have a roof over my head. Gosh, so, yeah. The therapist said, you know, we'll bring it along and we you have to go out into public. So this was the whole concept of this. Now, if I know I know your background, um, you have an interest in psychology. And if there's any other people, they can correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding of this kind of therapy was if you go into a public space and do exposure. Now, I know exposure work is good for anxiety because it's helped me with my social anxiety. Mm -hmm. But this was very different. This was like you go into a space, you feel really embarrassed. And the aftermath is, OK, well, I did that and I'm OK. So I'm setting the ground. <laughs> so uh, off we went in the car and um, we went to Extra Vision. So again, show my age for any <laughs> younger people looking. You used to have to go rent video uh, films. <laughs> so I went in the car and I had to go into Extra Vision and I had to walk in. This was like around the afternoon and I had to walk in and ask for um, a burger and a chips. Right. <laughs> so when she was telling me this, I was looking going like, who's the crazy one here? Yeah. You know, I have to do this. But again, I was like, just do it. Do it. You want to get better. You want to get better. Yeah. Just do it. Do it. So I went along, walked into extra vision and I was so socially anxious but I said if you're going to do this you're going to do it with it pure confidence <laughs> yeah you're going to commit to this horrendous act and you're going <laughs> to nail it so so I went in and I walked up and there was two people working and I always say this is like has led me in life the the two kind of people you meet when you tell them you have mental health and you don't have mental health was really presented in these two employees yeah. So I went up and I said, um, have you got, uh, can I get a burger and chips, please? And there was loads of people in the shop, obviously <laughs> starting to look. And the one of the staff said, um, what, a burger and chips? Can not get a bleeding burger and chips in here? And the other staff then was like, oh, there's actually a chipper just up the way there. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't enough. I had to up the ante with this. Okay. Part of my task and my assignment was to up the ante with this. So I had to say, um, what? Like, you can't get a burger and chips here. I'm telling you, the acting skills were off the scale here. I said, um, I said, yeah, I want to get a burger and chips. Like, do you not have them here? And this had to go on for a while and people were starting to turn in the shop and all. And then I said, OK, thanks. And I walked out <laughs> and I got in the car and I was just like, I feel terrible now mm. and like I couldn't go near Minute for a bloody about a year after that. Never went into extra vision since. They've right. all been gone no, anyway. Yeah. Thank God for that. That's re-traumatization. Um, but like, yeah, the whole me method behind this or the whole like, yeah, the whole understanding was that if you do this thing, you will feel OK, I'm still alive and I'm still OK after that. Okay. And that was so harmful. And I can tell that in a, a comedic way now and get mm. the, the humour out of it and laugh about how outrageous that was. But at the time, that was so harmful and so, like, damaging to mm. anywhere I was. And it sent me back months, months, you know. And I often see stuff like this happen in present day. I mean, that was back in 2006, but... I've worked in the service over the seven, last seven years and people have come in to me and said, I've been made do this or I've had to do this. I've been told I've had to do this. And I'm I'm scratching my head going, oh, God, that's awful. How could you be told to do that? You know, so, yeah, that's that's one of the ones that I can remember, you know. And yeah, well, it's funny. It's, yeah, it, 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 it is vaguely funny. And I mean, I've I've got a history of doing drama and stuff and as a comedy improv, funny enough. But if you're someone with distress, 
who's trying to learn to feel better and cope better in the world, it's sort of perplexing to me to see why someone would be put into a situation like that and almost have to pretend that they are more out of their wits than they are, you know, <laughs> and, and to escalate it. Um, you know, yeah, and OK, you survived the mortification, but at a big cost, you know, as, as you mm. described there. Um you you mentioned the bi the the medical model or the I I call it sometimes the biomedical model because it's to do with like the brain or the brain chemistry um mm -hmm. that we're told is faulty um uh, and that type of thing. Do do you think that this dominant psychiatric um model of distress gets in the way for people um informing safe trusting relationships with with the person? who's trying to help them yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely it does I mean I'm not um I'm critical of the the medical model the biomedical model and I'm critical for a few different reasons my own experience and my own journey um working in a system which is dominated by a biomedical model and then also um, hearing the stories of people that I supported over the seven years and how their needs weren't met and how they have found it harmful and restricting and limiting in their journey. So um, I think really relationships are key to any kind of work we do with people. And if we don't focus on the relationship building then forget about all your expertise and everything you've learned and studied about helping people with mental health. If you don't have a strong connection with a person and you don't take time to nurture that relationship, then I, I think everything else is really worthless in that space. Mm. And I think the problem with the biomedical model is that it's just focusing on illness. Now we can say we've come along and we're like a biopsychosocial model, hmm. but uh, I've are worked we in the service. Some no. people are bio, bio, bio yeah. still, and it, that's yeah, that's maybe like um, I don't want to like a blanket over every person that is um a clinician in that area because there are some really um progressive people in those spaces, but there aren't enough, and they aren't in lead positions. And I mean, if you're given a 15 minute appointment to someone every few months, how can you form a relationship? Yeah. And I mean, the whole thing is, well, I don't really have to have a relationship with someone because I am just prescribing the meds. And yeah, that's OK. Mm. That could be an argument. But if you're a person who has like me, for example, and everyone's experiences are different and you're at home and you're suicidal and you can't leave the house and then you finally go to an appointment and you're there for two hours in a waiting room and then you got brought into a room and sometimes as a doctor you haven't met before mm -hmm. and you're asked this list of, you know, do you hear voices? Are you suicidal? You know, the list of yeah. robotic questions and when you're asked them and then it's yeah medication you know and you're gone and that's that's the lower end of the service there are some really good people that offer more than that and I know that and I've met them and I've worked with some of them but a lot of people do, do still work from that framework and the biomedical model so and like the, the fallout of that for the people that actually attend is just such a negative experience of the system and not wanting to go again and not wanting to engage and I think as a peer support worker, in peer support, you know, it's all about connection and relationships. And it's the belief that relationships are healing. Mm -hmm. But what we have to be mindful of is that a lot of people, myself included, if you grew up in environments that relationships were harmful, you build a distrust to people. Right. So expect someone to come in and see you and to trust you instantly and open up and tell you their <laughs> deepest, darkest traumas. I think it's outrageous that we expect that of people. Yes. Yeah. And we do it yeah, continuously. Yeah. Or we blame but them for fact, not trusting us, you know, oh, she's got yeah. she's extra, you know, broken because she can't trust me and I'm, you know, yeah. trying so hard to help her with my list. Yeah. yeah and that's that's the thing it's like the blame is put back on the person there's never an acknowledgement 
of how this setup and this system is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's so wrong. There's never an acknowledgement. It's like, no, yeah, the person is just, they're not opening up or they won't tell me or like the worst one, you know, they were angry or they were irritated. Yeah. Been waiting in the waiting area for two hours yeah. and now like you're giving me 15 minutes you know so I don't think people um people in services aren't comfortable with people that are angry and I flock to the people that are deemed angry and aggressive because I'm like that to me is a trauma response mm -hmm. and it's their way of being in the world and um it's funny a lot of people that are deemed a lot of the time angry and aggressive I've never experienced anger and aggressive off them. So aggression. So we have to be questioning what is it in our approach, you know, and I think that's linked to trauma informed yeah. care, which I would be a strong advocate for. Um, and like strangely enough and oddly enough, it's not something we lead out on services with. Yes. It's in policies constantly. Um, but it's not really in training for mental health professionals. It's not mandatory. Yeah. So manual handling is mandatory, you know, but trauma-informed yeah. care isn't mandatory, you know, so it's, yeah. It's such a great point, though, as well, that like if you do learn about trauma and what are normal, predictable uh, responses to overwhelm, that you then don't get so offended if someone is angry with you. You know, that's one of the beauties of it, actually, is it becomes less about you and being offended or put out and kind of go, oh, well, what might I have said that prompted this? Or was it the long wait? Or was it the fact that I said I do something and then I didn't do it? You know, which mm -hmm. services do all the time. So um, I think for that part of it as well, managing the relational energetic flow between people and not like saying, well, you raised your voice at me, so I'm not working with you again. and Or, or you missed your appointment, your third appointment, so you're off the waiting list now. Um, yeah. It just yeah. creates a bit more compassion, I think, around that. But mm -hmm. then the systems themselves can be very rigid that if Kira or Jane miss three appointments, then that's it because the waiting lists are so long. So they'll give it to someone more deserving who actually values their appointments. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad because, you know, I've certainly missed appointments in, in the past. And even, you know, I had a caseload. I would work with 10 people at a time and I had a waiting list uh, with over 40 people on at one point and it was a year and a half wait list at one point and I always gave the allowance for missed appointments and if it was a continuous thing that open transparency about what's going on like yeah. is it's okay that you're missing them but do you want to take a break for a while do you want to take up this work maybe in six months down the line again yeah. when you feel that you're able to come in like not just a letter in the door that yeah. says you're out you know and um, look I know that I know that systems are massively stretched and workers are massively stressed I get that I know that like I've worked and I've seen the busyness of everyone working there um but we can't forget just the human courtesy and kindness element in mental health mm -hmm. and that's gone out of a lot of mental health spaces and really, we should be constantly leading on that in any human work that we do. Um, and I think that's just basic common sense, but it, it's become less common in a lot of services and systems. And um, yeah, it's again, the blame on the person and no acknowledgement of what can we do to to change that for people that use the service. Yeah. So you wrote this great piece um, called The Battle of the Pier for Mad in Ireland, which I read uh, a while back um, when you wrote it about your, your, your master's research. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like for you transitioning from being a patient, I guess, someone with, with um, mental health difficulties, with this very restricted life, the social anxiety and other, you know, coping strategies to then becoming an employee in the HSE. Did you feel welcomed and valued? Yeah, it's funny. Um, It's kind of changed over time. And my understanding of it has evolved a lot as, as this happens, as we we step into our role and our practice in this kind of work. But I think, um, yeah, like when I when I first heard about this job, 
I was in the National Learning Network and that's really when I got on my feet and it's the first time I experienced peer support okay. but it was informal peer support it was just meeting other people who had challenges and we'd sit around and people would talk openly about it and I found that really beneficial and this job came up and I always said yeah god I'd love to use my mental health I'd done the RAP program and I was trained as a facilitator in RAP within the National Learning Network and I thought, oh, God, like I can actually use all this crap <laughs> in a, a good way in life. Yeah. It's the first time that I kind of, yeah, it turned all what I perceived to be my biggest flaws into, you know, an asset now in life. And it's the first time that I went, whoa, I'm telling all this, this mortifying stuff about me, but it's it's having an impact in a really positive way on others. So that could help with me with the normalization and feeling better about myself. But when I got the job, we were sent to DCU and DCU do the peer support course okay. uh, and they train peers. So we were the first, again, the first 30 people to do that. So we were the first people doing DCU, the first people going in there into the HSC at the same time. And when I went to DCU, I was still very much in my earlier stages of, stages of my journey, still had social anxiety, but was doing better with it was starting to be around people more and getting comfortable with that was still a bit afraid of like you know sitting for lunch with everyone and more of the social aspects aspects but I could go in and sit down in the space and do my learning and that and um learn I suppose and do my assignments but there was such an energy in the room about how people had been harmed by the system okay and I had never heard that because I had left the system when you think how many years previous and um, seven years previous, I was gone out of the system. I didn't even put the dots together that the system wasn't for me at this point. Right, yeah. I just You were thought, still the problem in your own yeah, mind, I guess. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was still all me. So I can remember <laughs> being in there and I can remember uh, his good friend of mine, Liam McGowan now, is the, oh, yeah, the program chair at the time. And I can remember him sitting beside me and we were in this big circle and I can remember him sharing around a book and I think it was the myth of the medical model okay. and it was all about this kind of stuff and people were like that's great and loads of people had read it and I he said something about yeah well some people don't have disorders and I was like what and I was disgusted with him and I was sitting beside him and he said yeah, well, like if you think you have a disorder, you know, but some people actually don't think they have disorders. And I was so like, what the hell is this man talking about? Nice. And there was so such energy in that room about people had been harmed and were making meaning in their life differently. And that really challenged me. But it was actually so challenging for me to even go in there that I just kind of closed all that down. I was like, OK, these people are really angry. Don't know what they're angry for, but I'm just going to get a bit of tunnel vision and get myself through this bloody course. Right. Because I'm so like still in my earlier stage of recovery, I wanted to get this job, all this kind of stuff. Sure. So I went into the the HSC after her in I was going to say whispers. They weren't whispers at all. Um, very, very <laughs> articulate people speaking about how they'd been harmed and how psychiatry had been harming people for decades. So I knew these stories. But again, I didn't take it on. When I started on my team, my team were great. They were so welcoming, accepting. Um, so when peer support, the first cohort of peers were um, integrated into the service, there was a few conditions that had to be met. The team had to want them okay. and the team had to be ready and they uh -huh. had to be recovery orientated. So that makes I, sense. Otherwise yeah. it would be further harm potentially. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually what happened in some areas. Okay. But it didn't happen in mine in the beginning. I was like, this is great. And then I'd go back to the DCU space and people were talking about how horrendous it was. And I was like, my God, my team is lovely. This place is lovely. I love this job. And, yeah. you know, and I, I suppose I had rose tinted glasses to some extent. It's not to say my team weren't lovely. They were. But it was still very a medical model space. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. two things happened over the seven years. Right. I started to study more into that kind of system harm and um, 
the activist movement behind peer support. Peer support right. comes from a like survivor movement, survivor of psychiatry. Yeah. And it comes, it's rooted really in radicalism and activism. Mm -hmm. So I started to really get into that and look at that. So while I was learning more of that, my education on that was going up. And then my my awareness in the system was going up. So it was like the two of them were going up at the same time. And I started to see things then that maybe I didn't see in the beginning, just things of how people speak about people in meetings, uh -huh. you know, very medicalized and mm -hmm. um, how people were starting to. So another third part of that was really the people I was supporting, what they were telling me about their care or their interactions with the system over the years. So those three things together, my awareness, growth in my awareness, growth in my education, but also hearing the stories of others, the three of them became so strong. And then there was a change over in team. And I really think that the pandemic kind of disconnected a lot of people yeah, when that hit. And we never really got that back on my team. And then a lot of people started to leave and key recovery orientate people started to leave. And then different mindsets came in that were more medical focused and there was just a change. And then by the end, I was like, oh, my God, I need to move on from this space, you know. So I didn't find challenges in the beginning, but I found them later in my time in the system. And when we look at peer support research internationally, it's a mixed bag. Right. And in Ireland, in my own research, it's a mixed bag of how people um, how people are well integrated into the service. Now, I know some peers and they've said to me, I don't get involved in all the political stuff. And I'm not talking about just the political stuff within a ser service and an organisation. They're talking about the survivor movement, all that. Okay. And the activism, when they talk about that, they say, look, I don't really get into the activism side of peer support. I just focus on supporting people and the relationships. And look, that's OK. Fine. That's, yeah. that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I know that kind of person. I also have this fire in my belly for injustice and yeah. I speak out about it. So um, I really, really found uh, an alignment to that movement over time of being in the system. And now I'm very strong in that movement and I'm very... Um, yeah, all, like all my friends and everyone that I'm with in the pair world, like this is our cause and this is our our journey now, you know, in about systems and system harm. And um, yeah, so it really evolved over time and I'm happy that it did. I'm happy my eyes have been opened. They've been opened and they can't be shut now. And I think that's a really good thing. Very interesting. Your own gradual dawning awareness of the things that had contributed to your own distress and then how you'd not been uh, well served in many of your interactions with the mental health services and that many other people then who you came across had other stories of harm and injury from the systems that were supposedly trying to help them. Um, mm -hmm. So it makes total sense to me that that has become very important and the role of education there for you, your own education about yourself, but being educated more widely in um, the models and the recovery movement and, you know, the, the power of finding your voice as well, you know, the and the, the like it, it struck me when you were talking about using your own pain for the benefit of others, like almost a post-traumatic growth as well using the um the, the experiences to do some good in the world for others w would you say that's true Kira, or an element of it yeah yeah I mean it's it's given worth and value to all the shit that you've been yeah. through in life yeah. sorry yeah. excuse me but it's yeah it, it's given meaning and value and worth you know people find when we talk about recovery a lot of the time personal recovery now I think there's personal recovery and social recovery and in that there's an, an acknowledgement of a lot of things um but for really we talk about finding meaning in life and how important that is for all humans and people find meaning in different ways but for me I've really find, found meaning in um this cause of yeah like using my um lived experience and my hurt and my trauma in a positive way but also um like that whole 
spreading the word that there are other ways for Uh people to make meaning in their journey. Like I'm a strong advocate for that. So yeah, that all came from all, all the crap that I experienced and to change that around into something where it's actually meaningful and I feel really fulfilled as a human being and coming from someone who was very disjointed and broken Mm -hmm. for a lot of my life um, has just been a really beautiful transformation that I'm really thankful that I've come on. And I feel really like privileged in that way because there are many people that don't have that journey. And I suppose that's why I'm still, I still speak out about these things and I fight for these things. And yeah, I strongly advocate for these things because um, there are so many people that don't get to a point of that, yeah, like comfort in their journey, you know? And in themselves and being around other people, it's really, it's really a lovely um, journey. From your research and from working in the peer support role and now managing peers, what are the main barriers within the system um, in terms of, you know, making greater use of peers and having them maybe more effectively involved in teams? So, yeah, my I think my my whole um, thought on this has changed and maybe it's the perspective of being now outside the system, but I definitely think it was simmering in the last year of being uh, within the system as a peer support worker. Um, All the research tells us that, well, my own research in particular um, would say that there's a few things that really um, contribute to like that positive experience of integration of peers into systems. So the first one really was like the non-hierarchical ethos within a team because I've been at loads of meetings down the years and sometimes you walk into a meeting and you don't know who the lead or the clinical lead is or the psychiatrist or the consultant because it's just like everyone here is equal we're all a team yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. and I'm all about squashing that um, power imbalance but then I've been in other meetings where I walk in and by God, you know who the lead is, yeah. you know, and I think we've all experienced that. Yeah. So peers ha- work better in spaces that are non-hierarchical. Mm-hmm. And you can see why that's why that works, you know, because if you're going into a space where you're a peer and you've come through the service and then you're walking back into the service, mm-hmm. like the, the system was never built to have us in there, there. Like it was never built to have us in there. So you really need to be going into an environment where you're with the lead on the team thinks that everyone's input is as valuable. Mm-hmm. And that's what true multidisciplinary teams are. Yeah. It's we have all got a different expertise and we're all coming together to provide the best support for the person. But as we know, in a lot of teams, it doesn't go like that. Um, you know, the lead is the lead, the boss. They'll tell everyone else what people need, you know, and that still happens in 2024. So that's really positive for, for peers integration. The second thing is um, if it's a recovery orientated service, okay. because if it's a recovery orientated service, well, part of that is having the lived experience inside. Um, and just, yeah, I think passionate people that want you there on a personal level that want you there and like you there because I've had experiences over the years of introducing myself to different staff that start on the team and I always say you have two reactions it's kind of like back in the video shop yeah yeah, I was thinking (laughs) with the team I always wonder where they are now (laughs) so yeah when I tell people, say a psychiatrist, a trainee psychiatrist comes in and I always would make it my business to go meet them and tell them what my role is, because I don't want someone else saying, oh, look, we have a person with mental health on the team, you know, (laughs) define yourself for sure. Yeah. So I like to tell them what the role is and where it comes from and why I'm here and what I do and what work I do. So I always seek them out and I always get would get two reactions. There'd be someone that will say, oh, my God. That's a great idea. Brilliant idea. Well, like that's so important to give hope to others. You've been through the system. You've been through the journey. Or then you get the kind of (laughs) 
the moving away and looking at you <laughs> and you know that you're being assessed you know well, that yeah, they're yeah. thinking hmm, I wonder what kind of disorder she has <laughs> yeah. so there's those two kind of people and I've met them in all disciplines in all services and out in life and social circles when I tell people what I do so like there's a real sad thing about this as well just on a side note sorry there's lots of side notes um I like side notes (laughs) (laughs) big fan of side notes um so the yeah like that other like doctors don't get trained in recovery orientated stuff they don't get trained to know what peers are you know it's very like medical this is what we do and we go in and we do that and I actually in the last few years I do some guest lecturing in Trinity for Fabulous. clinical psychologist students and um, trainees. I do guest lecturing in UCD for postgrad nursing students and third year nursing students and um, psych students, psych nurse students, and I go into DCU as well with the peer support course. So in those environments, they I I teach on peer support and lived experience and the recovery model. So they are learning about this and they're getting to know that. And when I see people come in and I meet, you know, a nurse or a doctor, uh, a nurse, and I tell them about, you know, I'm recovery orientated. And some of them will say, especially if they come through DCU, they'll say, um, oh, yeah, no, I heard about all the recovery model. I know about peer support. It's great. There's one here because I was the only one in Dublin for months. So it's kind of rare, you know, when they were happy to be on that. But often they whisper to me, Oh, Kara, I'm really recovery orientated, but I have to do what the culture is doing or the seniors are doing, you know. So, yeah, we don't teach enough people about that. And even if we do, they get in the system and they get swept up by the culture anyway. Yeah, I was just thinking one of the things I talk about on, on this um with some of the guests is values and working in a system where you have to um go on or interact or function in a way that's out of step with your values. I mm. imagine there must actually be quite a lot of mental health professionals who who are not in alignment with their own values, particularly if some of them have had some emotional distress of their own and they they might know why they experience certain things or family members, you know, um, and yet the system is telling them there was something in the wiring of their brains from the time they were born or a chemical imbalance um, and that none yeah. of the wider stuff, like the the racism they might have encountered or the gender-based violence, that none of that has been relevant. That must sit quite uncomfortably within a person, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If they're learning that and that's all been part of their, yeah, their learning. And, you know, a lot of doctors and nurses, they're they're in those educational environments for years. And that's why I really respect tutors and lecturers in those spaces that are bringing this, because we have to remember that like recovery orientated practices, lived experience. Yes, it came from the people who use the service. But, you know, this is backed by mental health policy, sharing the vision, vision for change, the WHO and the United Nations released a document late last year about how we should be moving to more more rights based, acknowledging all the social determinants of mental health and moving away from the medical model. So it's not just the crazy people that are saying this. It's it's coming from the other stuff, the big guns. And I think that gives the argument away. But why are students not learning about this? Like my um a good friend of mine, Karina Murphy, is a, a teacher in UCD and she gets me in to teach the the nursing students there. And her background is nurse, and she's very strong on recovery orientated and peer support and education, educating the students. And anytime I go in, I have great interactions with nurse and students and I tell them about the experience of peers in the system and they think it's a great idea. But mm-hmm. then again, they go into the system, they're swept up. And look, peers are not the only people on mental health teams with mental health challenges. They're not. We're not. For sure, we're, not, we're open about it. You're just it. open about it. That's the if difference. If we have a, a sticker on our head, <laughs> you know, we're out as being 
the mental people, yeah. but we're not the only ones on the team. And similarly to students telling me that they can't really work like that because they're on placement. There's also other staff who have come up from all disciplines and told me about their mental health challenges in life. And they haven't You're told a safe people. person to tell. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Really sad, really sad. And I mean, I've had everyone from every discipline talk to me about stuff like that over the years, students, staff members, everything. And like, it's sad if we're if we're in mental health, why can't we lead out on this normalization? But I do know there are I remember doing a course before with um, a psychiatrist from Europe somewhere and she spoke about openly about her mental health challenges and she said actually in her country she'd be struck off yeah. if she was told you know so there is that element of it as well yeah. because it is again that the the well we we spoke about this before um during the interview the the enduring stigma i guess and how once a person has had mental health difficulties for some people that just renders them perpetually a bit kind of unstable or not entirely to be relied upon I guess that probably feeds a bit of this I'm the professional you're the person with the lived experience but it makes it difficult to be authentic and to feel at ease that kind of false um, dichotomy and and really we're all vulnerable to this because mm. it's just a matter of degree or the right or the wrong circumstances and the presence or absence of relational supports at a given time as well, whether someone will have a mental health episode or a physical health episode. You know, it's um, it's, it's not about strength necessarily or, or being mm. impervious to this, I think. No. Um, and I'm sorry, Jane, I did go off on the side note there because you asked, that was a really, really long side note because you were asking about peers get integrating into yeah. services. But I suppose it's all relevant in some way. But I mean, yeah, a lot of peers like and especially in, in my research, a key part that came out of the research and I haven't found it in any other research yet that focus um, specifically on the language that peers use to describe working in systems and okay. like the words that came up were like stand up fight like going to war someone mentions Che Guevara you know it's like that's... revolutionaries <laughs> yeah and that's that was really instilled in in DCU and the training but also like not just instilled by them it's not an agenda that they have but it is advocates of that movement and I mean, if you feel like you're going to work and battling all the time and fighting. So I, I've come on to this new way of thinking. And um, a good friend of mine is um, um director, co-director of Attentional Peer Support. And we speak about this all the time and just how like is peer support better suited outside the system, uh -huh. like working independently where the service externally refers refers to peers outside because there is um a, um oh, what's the word I'm looking for there's a oh god I can't think now is it like co-opting um, or, or sort of yeah co-opting opting but like it puts like it's it can be damaging to the mm. role because it can be damaging to the authenticity of the role. Yes. And I've found that and I've heard that from other peers. You know, I've been I can remember when I start working there and um, one of the doctors said to me, one of the psychiatrists said, oh, great. Can you help people take their medication? Right. And I went, um, and I didn't really know no. what my job was <laughs> at that time. Again, yeah. I didn't know, like I was still learning. I, I was only new and I was only in the door. I was thinking, um, actually, I don't think that's part of my role. Mm. But I am, even though I'm socially anxious a lot of the time, I am a strong personality and a strong person. And I have a strong voice and I have no fear of speaking out about things. But if you don't have those things and someone can tell you or say you have to do that, it's very easy to go along and do things. Yes. And part of that is also who you're managed and supervised by. 
you know, there's a fear and this comes up in research that you end up just being a part of that discipline. Mm. You know, I was managed and supervised by social work and that was so many challenges because they have their specific way of working, but it's not peer support. So it's conflict even within your supervision space, but then your ide ideology of what way to support people. And I found the whole thing very educational, a great experience to work in the system. But I'm now in a place where I question will pairs ever truly work to their full potential and be unharmed in those spaces? Because a lot of people have been harmed. And I know pairs that have left because they were harmed mm -hmm. in the system that harmed them originally in their story or previously in their story. So it's, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm at the space where I'm like, God, do pairs even belong in the system anymore? You know? So do you, do you think then maybe uh, being employed by an NGO or something like that, or that, that, that yeah. is potentially because mm -hmm. I, like to me the space for both paid and unpaid peers I guess but certainly you're more vulnerable to harm within the system if you're dependent for your pay on mm -hmm. working in accordance with uh whatever the mod the dominant model happens to be um mm -hmm. And actually, just about the recovery oriented model sitting within a wider biomedical based system, uh, mm. Sandy Bloom, who wrote the, the books on sanctuary uh, and the sanctuary model in Philadelphia was where the whole um, phrase of it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you kind of came from that. They mm. worked amazingly well with a flattened hierarchy, multidisciplinary, really um, amazing way of working for years. Mm. But the wider system never really wanted them and was always trying to squash them back to what what it, what it could um, handle better or understood better. So I suppose yes. that kind of speaks to your it's trendy mm -hmm. to have peers. Uh, you know, there's nothing about us without us and from a rights based mm -hmm. perspective, but it's not all that easy to comfortably um, maybe house peers in the system that as you say, wasn't designed for them. That's what I'm mm. kind of hearing from you there. Yeah, and you're right. It's like, yeah, peers are part of that recovery movement. And you're so right to say it's trendy. It's like a buzzword. It's kind of like trauma and yeah. care now as well. You know, they're all buzzwords, the lived experience. Oh, it's great to have them in here. But sure, what the hell do we do with them when they're in here? And then mm. if they want to work the way they want to work, well, you know, well, that's going to be challenging. So, yeah. I mean, there is that whole I, I did the co-option piece and then people, yeah, going along, I have a job, I'll just go in and keep my head down and do it. And I've heard people say that, look, I have a job now, I'm just going to keep my head down and do it. And that really depends on the individual because it's not to say that lived experience isn't helpful in this spaces, mm. these spaces. And I used to always, always say this because I, when I met with a lot of activists in my earlier days, they always said, God could never work in the service. How the hell do you work in the service? And I used to say, well, look, whether we like it or not, the dominating theory in society is that when you have a problem with your head, you go to the doctor you get meds or you go to the secondary services and it's illness and it's a mental illness in your brain and you go through the system. So whether we like it or not, that's what people think. And that's what the majority of society do. So there are many people going through the doors that need mm -hmm. and will benefit from peer support in those spaces. And I used to be a real advocate for that. I used to say, oh, well, sure, everyone's coming in here anyway. Like, so we might as well be there for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still think there's some truth in that. But for me, on a personal level, it, it's not for me anymore. And I feel I've done my time in that space. And I, I found it really draining over time to constantly fight that battle. And, you know, and there are other pairs who, you know, are probably in really good team environments like that team you're talking about. And they can work a bit independently from the system. Yes, there are other parts of the system that will always feed in and influence. but if you're happy in your day to day work and you don't feel that, then maybe it's easier to go on. But I really think like a failure for one of us is a failure for all of us. Mm. But then I am I'm in the high end 
super passionate place about that and <laughs> I, I appreciate it changed that the world everybody... space <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that not everybody is there and it's not to say they're not doing good work in those spaces they absolutely are but yeah it's just where I am in my journey and what I think of the pair role and where I think it would work best and I've seen so much harm um happen you know to peers who went into the system very enthusiastic I'm gonna make a change in here I think I said at one point I'm gonna change the system from the inside how naive I was back then but you know (laughs) well you gave it a good go you know and you understand to to me it sounds like you understand the whole system so much better now having been at various points of it you know it's kind Mm. of Sometimes it's easy to criticize a system, say, as a a service recipient, but then to try and do your best within it as well um, with Mm. the the constraints to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, You you just have, in a way, a greater authority, frankly, to speak on all of it now um, by Mm. having having um, multiple perspectives there. I'm conscious Mm. of our time, Kira, because um. As, as I kind of predicted, we've had a great old chat um, mm-hmm. and I don't want to keep you much longer, though. I have one question that I kind of ask everyone. And it's to do with what do you think politicians and policymakers could do to enable all children to have a safe, healthy, connected and equitable childhood so that they're well placed to then flourish as adults? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's such a, I kind of get overwhelmed when I think about what can we do to fix the mess that is mental health and the services and how we support people. And I mean, there's loads of great initiatives happening for children. I think, you know, we all speak about early intervention and going into schools and kind of normalizing their experience and I mean, I don't really have trust in, I think politics is just such in a dark place at the mm-hmm. moment in Ireland with, you know, the rise of the far right and just the further distance between the working class and the wealth in this country. Yeah. And that could be at a whole other podcast on that. Mm-hmm. But um, I I just feel, and, and look, we have good policies. We have good policies. But the problem with policies is that they're not implemented and they're not, they're not enforced is the wrong word, but they're not um yet. Yeah, we're not held accountable on whether we are actually following those guidelines or not. So I think we have good policies mm. and we have a lot of good policies in place, but they're just not happening on the ground for people and for services. So I know mental health reform as part of their pre budget submission. So I'm on the board for mental health reform Brilliant. and a part of their pre budget submission is about um funding for implementing sharing the vision okay. to like that we really implement implement that in services um because i think we've had it like when did vision for change come out 2006 or something mm-hmm. is it yeah, right? yes yeah. like nearly of... 20 years ago and yeah. um, that we've been speaking about this stuff so recovery isn't a new concept it's been around a long time it is time that we start implementing it but going back to children and how to prevent and help children like, you know, avoid harm in life. I think trauma, hurt is unavoidable, really, right. for us all. Mm-hmm. I think we've all experienced that, whether we acknowledge it or we understand it, really. And I think um, for me, when I think of all that stuff, I get overwhelmed because I can't fix it all and I can't do anything to change it. And I bring it back to what I think is key and it's relationships. Mm. And there's a part of the IPS model where, um, you know, the ripple effect that relationships can have. So in my own personal life, if I can try and mend and grow and nurture the relationships that I have, and even in professional relationships, personal relationships, then I feel there's a bit of a ripple effect happening in my small, tiny, tiny part of the world. But if we can all focus on doing that, um, I think it can help. And it's a really basic thing, because as I said, I don't have trust in politicians or the government or 
making changes. We have the policies, I think, but just not. We need strong leaders maybe in those spaces. I'm very fortunate. I haven't mentioned it at this point, but I just think it's important to mention it as well of there are good things happening and there are pockets of good change happening within the service, but also outside. And I think um, I'm part of a project called Kerry Farm. So I just joined the board of that last month. I've been involved with that for nearly four years now. It's very and exciting. That is, it's, it's brilliant. Like, And it's really going to change the landscape, I think, of Ireland and how we offer support to people. So... Kerry Farm is a therapeutic um, farming environment where most of the work is really done in relationships and meaningful participation throughout the project. Um, but there will be guests will come and stay on the farm for a period of three to six months. And we don't have that at the moment. All yeah. we have is community services and we have um, inpatient. So I think that's really I think that's the future of mental health and the plan with Kerry Farm is to have this adult one set up and the next phase is to have one for children. Okay, well. So I really think that that's what we should be moving towards as a model. It's rights based, trauma informed and it's recovery orientated and the lived experience has been really integrated in every part of that plan and design I mean I was at a meeting last night uh, last week with loads of architects and engineers and you know spaces that I would never be in but they're really bringing the lived experience into every space so um yeah I think yeah I don't know if that answers your question but well it it, it does and, and just kind of on on the the topic of this podcast about relationships and how they matter it's great that you emphasize that we all have that capacity to relate to one another in a healthy uh mm -hmm. safe reciprocal kind compassionate way or we can choose even if we deliver services to people to not do that you know mm -hmm. and perhaps further uh greater relational harm and even if we don't work at all you know we're just in communities and there are people who are distressed around us we can know the importance of relationships and just be kind i think you know mm -hmm. um Frankly, I say this sometimes, we'll never have enough services to meet the need either. You know, there'll always be waiting lists. And in the meantime, if we can all be a little bit perhaps more present for one another when we can, um, that might have that ripple effect that you were kind of talking about and maybe reduce a person's distress ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because as I said, I get overwhelmed when I think of, all the things that are wrong and trying to so like passionate about so many causes you know like what's happening in Palestine and like it's just yeah there's so many things to and happen in this country with the far right there's so many things to be passionate about and it can be overwhelming so that's when I like to just bring it back to okay what am I doing in my little part of the world to make things a, a little easier for everyone that I meet really yeah I think that's that's a beautiful place to leave it, Kira, because it what you say is I think typical of many people right now. Overwhelm is through the roof, kind of just mm. a sense of the planet is a kind of a shit show and uh democracies are falling apart and the harms that we're doing to one another in various ways. Um, but we do still have a little patch. We do have relationships with people mm -hmm. coming in and out of our lives. And if we can only be a little bit more present present and and kind, um, some of the time even, uh it will have hopefully a knock on good effect. So thank you so much for joining me today, Kira Glynn. It's been beautiful to have you. I learned an awful lot. I, I think we could uh, chat here for another two or three hours, quite possibly. Maybe, maybe you'll come back in the future. Um, but this has been Relationships Matter with me, Jane Mulcahy and the wonderful Kira Glynn. Thanks. Thanks.